Mono versus stereo. It's an age old debate with live audio engineers. Let's dive in today. Oh, and be sure to hang around. We're gonna go to the nerd zone today. So buckle up. Hey, if you're new here, my name's James, and I help sound tech save the day by making things sound better and eliminating distractions. So if you're playing or running sound at the pub on Friday or church on Sunday, you're in the right place. Mass that subscribe button, and welcome to the Club of Sound Ninjas. Two goals that we have in live sound are consistency and intelligibility. We want everybody to get about the same mix, and we want it to be as intelligible as possible. Nobody leaves humming the kick drum, so we need to make our vocals loud and clear, even in our quest for mix energy. We also want to deliver the best mix for every single seat in the listening area. The idea behind choosing a mono system is that people on the left side of the room want to hear the same thing as the people on the right side of the room. So if you have the same mix coming from a similar speaker to both sides of the room, then potentially you're getting the most consistency from spot to spot. With a bigger room, if we pan something all the way to one side and all the way to the other, people on the opposite sides wouldn't hear that thing very well. It's not like in the studio where we have stereo and people are hearing both speakers equally. So in brief, that's the case for having a mono sound system. Now let's talk about the arguments for a stereo system. The most important input that we have is the lead vocal. So we have to make sure that the lead vocal is not covered up or masked by any other input. So that means that we need to pull it down either than level overall or with certain frequencies to make space for that lead vocal to sit on top of the mix, but not so far out in front that it feels like it's by itself. With a stereo mix, we can move some things to the outside or the sides of the mix to make more room right in the middle for that lead vocal. Now that doesn't mean necessarily panning mono inputs, hard left and hard right, but it includes some stereo techniques that we'll talk about more in just a second. In a studio environment, it's easy to pan mono sources hard left and hard right because we can assume that the listener is hearing both speakers wherever they're listening. Like we talked about a minute ago, people on the left side of your big room might not hear the right side of the PA, or at least they're not gonna hear it clearly. Now I've talked about stereo inputs, but what do I mean by that? Well, a stereo input is one that has different information on the left side and the right side, and it gives it some variation. It also is gonna have some stuff that's in both channels equally. We call that the center channel. And that's really what happens when we have two speakers or two sound sources that are producing the same sound at the same time, we perceive that as right in front of us if they're at equal level in timing. That's what's called the phantom center channel. Technically speaking, it's all the stuff that's happening in both channels, left and right, equally. So with a stereo input, some of these sounds and some of the tones are happening differently on the left side versus the right side. One good example of this that you might already have is a stereo keyboard with a stereo piano patch. A piano is a pretty large instrument, and so there are different notes emanating from different parts of the piano, and if we're close to it, we can perceive, okay, this note is coming a little bit more from over here, and this note's coming a little bit more from over here. When we push up a stereo input, there's less right in the middle that's competing for the space of that lead vocal. And the kick and the snare, if that's kind of what you're into. Another cool thing about having a stereo PA is you get to use effects and some ear candy, or things that are really happening just on the left side and the right side that aren't necessarily the critical backbone parts of your mix, but they add a little bit more excitement and a little bit more depth to the mix. Let's take toms, for example. If during a drum fill, the drummer plays the rack tom and then the floor tom, and that happens kind of left to right for the audience, that's gonna give some ooh or interest to the listener, even if they don't really notice it, they're gonna notice that not everything is coming from exactly the same direction. In the effects realm, having a ping pong delay or a repeat of the vocal that happens on the left side and then the right side, that can be a lot of fun to play with and it makes a lot of interest in your mix. It's especially helpful when you can highlight that one line of a song that needs to hang on just a little while longer. It's these little things that we can do as engineers that add that ear candy and creates interest for the listener. Again, we're just trying to amplify what's going on on stage and polish it up a little bit. This is one of those ways that we can put icing on the cake. Another place we can have fun with stereo is with electric guitars with 
two different delays on left and right. One standard one is to have an eighth note delay on one side and a quarter note delay on the other one, but things get really fun when we have a dotted eighth on one side and a quarter note on the other one. This adds some syncopation and some back and forth, and it really can be a lot of fun. It creates a soundscape rather than having everything coming from one direction. Now, if only there was a tool that could put sounds across the panorama of the soundscape, and maybe it's a potentiometer. So we could have a panoramic potentiometer. Oh, wait, we do have a panoramic potentiometer. It's called the PanPot, or just Pan for short. So now you know where that came from. When you learn to drive, you are probably told to keep your hands on the steering wheel at 10 and two. This gives you good grip and you can make turns and cross over and do all that fun stuff. And you probably don't think about that a lot anymore if you've been driving for a while. But 10 and two can be really helpful for our panning scheme as well. Because let's take background vocals with the lead vocal, for example, and let's imagine that we have two of them, or we have two different inputs that are balanced. Uh, this could be guitars, this could be keyboards, it could be background vocals, whatever you'd like. But 10 and two is a good middle of the road way to go. You can use panning as a tool to make your mix have more depth, and that includes for people on the left side and the right side. Let's head to the nerd zone for just a little bit and talk about what the pan pot is actually doing. The pan pot is actually a logarithmic level control between left and right, where in the middle, it's accommodating for how the sound is going to combine in free space and double in energy. Usually in normal real life, this would mean 6 dB of boost, but uh, with actual comb filtering and small differences between the speakers, we have our center point for our pan pot at 3 dB down for both sides. This is called the stereo pan law. As you turn the pan pot to one side or to the other, it turns up one side just a little bit, and it turns down the other side quite a bit. As you move farther over, now you've turned it up all the way on one side and all the way off on the other. So if we pan two of our vocals to 30% left and 30% right, now people on the left side are going to get a little bit more level on that left background vocal and a little bit less level on the right background vocal. And if this was just a purely sterile anechoic chamber that people were listening to, you might say, now you're changing the balance of those background vocals for one side of the room versus the other side of the room. And while that's true, we're not in an anechoic chamber and there are reflections going on. So while you're getting less energy directly from that speaker, you're still getting more energy from the far side speaker. That added energy and more reverberant sound adds a certain amount of space. So we didn't just change the balance of one versus the other, we added more space or depth to one background vocal versus another one. And people on the opposite side are getting the opposite balance, right? The people on the right side of the room are hearing more of one vocal and they're hearing a farther away version of the other vocal. So it's not just that we change the balance, we've added space and depth by using a little bit of panning. And people right in the middle get just a little bit of separation left to right, and that's cool too. So you have to be careful with using your pan, and you can't always go to the extremes, but for some things you can. You can test this out with your PA if you want. Take a signal and pan it all the way to one side so that it's only coming out of one speaker. Now walk to the other side of the room and you're still hearing sounds coming from that speaker even though they're not direct. You're getting the reverberance and the bounces and the off-axis response of that speaker. So you're still getting that from the other side, but you're also getting a little bit less level on your side when you pan something over. 10 and two doesn't make it too extreme and that's a good way to balance things out. Now, the only problem with this is when a, somebody that was singing a background vocal is now singing the lead part and you have to compensate for that. And maybe those are other changes that you need to make and mix on the fly from song to song. Now you could be a purist and argue that somebody on one side is getting an inferior mix because they're not getting the perfect balance of all of those vocal parts. And I'd say if that's really important to you and your band needs really tight harmonies where everybody gets the balance just the same, yeah, in that situation, keep them panned right in the middle. But you can do it for say two rhythm guitars or a guitar and a piano as well. And that can be pretty cool. Just don't go crazy and walk around the room and check the different sides and make sure that it still works for everybody. 
So this test may or may not work and you might be able to hear what I'm doing and maybe you won't, uh, but I'm recording on my lav mic right here and it's omnidirectional, but I've gotten pretty good results for hearing what I'm hearing through it usually when I'm walking around. So we're gonna test out this sound system at Forerunner Church and test out the left and right and see what it sounds like. I'm gonna pan an acoustic guitar hard left and then hard right and walk around and see how it changes. And then I'm gonna put it in the middle and see if I like it more, you know, being a little darker and a little brighter in some places, or if the comb filtering is really noticeable. And yes, this would compound over all the instruments, but maybe this will work and maybe it won't, but that's why we're gonna come along for the ride and try it out. So here we go. So this is panned to the center. Okay, so I am hearing some of the comb filtering. Um, let's see if putting it left and right makes it any better or this is just kind of an experiment. So now we're panned to the right and this speaker right in front of me is the right speaker. So when I move over to in front of the left speaker, So that wasn't really terrible. I'm not really upset about that. You know, if I had something to balance it on the other side, I really don't think it was really gonna be a big issue. You see if I can find one spot where it's kind of dead-ish. So that way, if it's just the acoustic guitar playing, then that might be a little bit weird because then it's like, oh, that sounds kind of far away. If it's just like the acoustic guitar and the vocal. So one of these speakers is supposed to be swapped. I think these two right here, now those two over there, those are supposed to be swapped left and right. So over here in this section, I've got nothing with it panned to whatever side I panned it to, I don't remember. So double check your stereo outputs, everybody. Uh, found that. I mean, nothing's really bothering me except for that place where it's mismatched. Well, this is a little darker right here. So we've got you know, that speaker there and that center cluster up there. So that's kind of dark and out of the way. That probably wouldn't be there as much if we were panned it to the center. But I'm really thinking that if I had something on the opposite side to balance it out, I really wouldn't have a problem with the way this guitar sounds or the way that my whole mix sounds. So even though it's technically, you know, kind of wrong to pan mono inputs all the way to one side, why don't you just try it and listen in your space? It might be worth a shot and could open up some cool possibilities for your mix. So now that we've talked about this a little bit, let's go to the nerd zone and figure out what's going on a little bit more in depth with our hearing and perception. Welcome to the nerd zone. I'm your resident nerd, James Attaway. 
Let's jump into binaural hearing. Your ears perceive sounds that come from 360 degrees around your head and up and down. This is called binaural hearing. It's really cool. We're a lot better at localizing sounds on the horizontal plane than we are on the vertical plane, but we can still hear up and down pretty good. We localize sounds in two different ways, or maybe three if you categorize it a different way, but basically there's two. The first one is the level difference between our ears. If something's louder on the left side than it is the right side, our brain says, that's coming from over there. The other way is with timing. Lower frequencies will bend around your head, so it's hard to tell what the level difference is. You mostly hear a timing difference between left and right. So if a sound arrives at one ear before the other ear, our brain is like a big phase computer and it says, ha ha, the sound's coming from that direction. We also use sound cues to tell how close or far away something is. High frequencies dissipate over distance, so something that's farther away is going to sound darker, or there will be a lower proportion of high frequencies compared to the low frequencies. The other way we tell distance is by the proportion of direct sound to reflected sound. If you're standing in a gymnasium and somebody's really close to you and talking, you hear more of their direct sound from their voice than you do the reverberant sound. But if they move very far away, you're hearing more of the reverberant sound compared to the direct sound. But if we move outside to some place where there's not a lot of reflections, we're not gonna hear as many of the reflected sounds, but the sound will be darker the farther away they are. High frequencies dissipate over distance in the form of friction. So if something sounds really dark, it probably means that it's far away. Now in live sound reinforcement, we're trying to take two speakers to emulate what it's like for a lot of different sound sources and put them all so that they can cover a large area so lots of people can enjoy the sound we make. With a mono system and our mixer, we can approximate depth by pulling something quieter or making it darker like it's farther away or adding artificial reverberation, which makes it feel like it's in a room or someplace else. When we add two speakers, we can place the same signal to both speakers at the same time. And if we're the same distance from both of those speakers, our brain will say, hey, I think that's coming from straight in front of me. This is called the phantom center channel. One problem that can get created when we have two different speakers with the same thing coming out of both of them is that not everybody is the exact same distance from both speakers. This causes the same sound to arrive at your ear at two different times, and that creates a phenomenon called comb filtering. Comb filtering cancels out certain frequencies so that they go away, and if that time difference changes as we walk around from one side of the room to the other, then we get different frequencies that cancel out. So that's it for the Nerd Zone. Thanks for coming. Okay. We're back from the deep nerd zone and now we're back to like the cool audio engineer nerd zone. So next we're gonna talk about a method from a guy named Dave Ratt. Now Dave Ratt is the founder of Rad Sound. He's done front of house for Red Hot Chili Peppers, Weezer, a bunch of other really huge acts. And he's been really innovative in the audio sphere. And he's recently come out with a method of stereo mixing that's trying to reduce this comb filtering that's happening between the left and the right speakers for your live sound system. So this would be another reason why you would want to go stereo for your live sound PA. If this is a little bit heady and nerdy for you, you can go ahead and skip down to the next section where I give you my final thoughts. But this is going to get a little bit deep if you're just kind of like, I just want to know the surface stuff. There's your disclaimer. So Dave Ratt on his channel has been talking about a stereo method that's supposed to reduce comb filtering by having two inputs from the same source that are decoupled, so they're not interacting in exactly the same as one another, but they sound similar, and those are panned hard left and hard right. This way, those two signals don't interact in the same way that a signal that's mono, or the exact same signal coming from both speakers at the same time, but arriving to each listener at a different time, it's gonna interact in a different way and produce less comb filtering. The theory behind this is that yes, each input might have a little bit of comb filtering from the left and the right side, but all of those inputs are gonna have a little bit different comb filtering from the left and the right side. So whereas your electric guitar might be comb filtering at a certain way, 
your acoustic guitar is comb filtering in a different way. And so the combination of both of those end up overlapping and creating a more pleasing sonic landscape. So a mono source that you might try to decouple and kind of make a stereo source is an electric guitar amp. So you put a microphone on the center of the cone and you put a microphone on the outside of the cone. There are different distance from that guitar amp. So they're gonna have a little bit of different arrival time to those microphones. And then you EQ each microphone to sound similar. So the mic that's closer to the outside of the cone, maybe you try to make that brighter or you use a brighter microphone in the first place so that the tones somewhat match and you're painting with kind of the same color on both sides, though these inputs are now decoupled. They won't completely cancel out when you flip the polarity of one of them. Some of this is better heard than talked about, so let's head over to the computer and I'll show you some stuff about it. Here's an example of inputs that are decorrelated. It's a stereo input, got a stereo keyboard and it's soloed. And I have on here a mix tool which has a polarity flip or invert phase is what it says. I don't appreciate that. It's polarity, not phase. So we're gonna be bypass that or not. And on this one, it doesn't have that on there. So we'll listen to both of those in stereo. You can hear it if you're wearing headphones or if you're already on your phone, it's mono. And then I'll hit the mono button over here so we can all hear it in mono as well. So let's take a listen to this and see if this is correlated or decorrelated from the source. All right, so I didn't hear a lot of it go away. There's still a good amount of the fundamental frequencies in those. So I would say that those are decorrelated inputs. So awesome to have those stereo left and right. Now let's take our electric guitar channels. Let's see if these are also correlated or not. So when I inverted the phase or inverted the polarity on one of them, it got very thin, it got very far away. So I would say that these are correlated inputs. So I would have to work to decorrelate them in the stereo field for them to not have comb filtering from one side to the other. So here I've duplicated a channel on the acoustic guitar. So these are exactly the same. And you'll be able to hear that they're exactly the same because on this mix tool, uh, when I engage it, it will invert the polarity, and because they're identical, that polarity inversion will make it all cancel out. So let's take a listen to that. So those are totally canceling out with the polarity inversion. Now on this one, I've put a sound delay plugin so we can hear what different comb filtering sounds like at different numbers of milliseconds. In acoustic space, you can approximate one foot per millisecond. So one foot difference between the left speaker and the right speaker would be one millisecond of delay, approximately. So I'm gonna turn this on and sweep this around so that you can hear what the timing difference is making on hearing one speaker earlier than the other. So let's listen to that. To me, that sounds really bad. I hope it sounds really bad to you too. So that's what we're trying to avoid by the stereo technique. Using the same delay process, if I have the exact same signal on the same two channels, they're panned hard left and right, it's gonna show here on the correlation meter if the left and right are gonna sum into mono perfectly or not. 
So with sound delay off, or there's zero milliseconds of delay there, and mix tool and the polarity inversion off, and I hit play on this, we can both see and hear we've got 100% or one on the correlation meter. If I take our delay and I start to roll this delay up, we can say now things are not correlated as much. And with the left and right, we're not as even. Or uh, if we take this all the way down back to zero and we turn on the polarity inversion, now it's all negative correlation. So it's all canceling out evenly on the left and right sides because when the one is pushing, the other one is pulling. And that's happening across the whole frequency spectrum and at the same time. So the benefit of this is that your band inputs that are now in stereo sound bigger because not all of them are comb filtering in the same way in every seat. Now, the thing that I don't quite 100% understand with this and haven't tested out is that the lead vocal is gonna be panned right to the middle. So no matter what, that's gonna comb filter in a different way no matter what seat you're in. The potential problem that I see with this is that certain frequencies of the vocal are gonna cancel out and maybe that decreases intelligibility in a way that you can't perceive from front of house unless you're in that one spot. Or the mix is doing something on the left and the right that kind of clutters up and makes it so that it's harder to keep that lead vocal out in front and uncovered. At least when everything is comb filtering the same way, you're getting all the same cuts across your entire mix. Now I've done a little bit of testing on this that I'm probably gonna put into another video. Stay tuned for that so you can keep updated on when that comes out. And I would love to talk about this more. If you're interested and wanna go deep down the rabbit hole, I'm game. I just gotta find some PAs to test it out on. I mean, it could be really cool or it could be overkill if your band isn't the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So maybe we'll find out. So if you wanna explore this a little bit and kind of see if your sound system is creating a lot of comb filtering, turn on some pink noise or any other test signal and walk left to right through your room, making sure that you're going a different distance from both of the speakers. You might hear something that sounds a lot like a phaser pedal if you're a guitar player, or there's this thing that's happening as you change distances from each of the speakers. Sometimes you can hear it on music, but it's really apparent when you put on pink noise, but don't put the pink noise too loud, that's just obnoxious. So in summary, with all the deep nerd stuff set aside, would I recommend a stereo PA over a mono PA? In most situations, the answer is yes. When would I recommend mono? Well, if you've got a really odd shaped room that's got a lot of different zones and tangents coming off the main listening area, that might be a lot easier just to make it mono and call it a day. Sometimes budget constraints mean that you can't hang stereo hangs under your balcony, things like that. It's gonna make a bigger difference to make sure that your sources are sounding good and that your mono mix sounds good in that situation. Setting up your room in stereo gives you a lot more options for creating depth and space in your mix. And I think it's actually worth it. You're gonna have to cover every single area anyway. You might as well run a different signal to each of those channels. And it's more than ear candy and it's more than things that just the sound tech can appreciate. So it really does make a difference for what you can do and how you can open up space for the vocals by having stereo inputs panned hard left and right. Even if your average listener can't tell that they're listening in stereo, they still will appreciate having that extra space and depth. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and mash thumbs up and share it with a friend that might be interested in setting up their PA the right way. And if you wanna join in the discussion, drop your comments down below. I love hearing from the Sound Ninja community. If you're in a band or running sound at church, be sure to mash that subscribe button and don't bother with the notification bell. You've got too many notifications in your life already. If you wanna actually practice mixing and take your mixing skills to the next level, go ahead and sign up for my virtual sound check challenge. You can find more info through the link in the description below and it's totally free. Remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo and nobody leaves humming the kick drum. Check out some more videos over here and we'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.